It's time for bringing in troops. Little Zoom from Quarantine Show. Brought to you today by Nervous. I'm like the substitute teacher who's going to screw up the Zoom. And everybody should know Zoom by now because we've been doing it for a whole year. But Judy's not here. I'm, I'm your producer today, Tom, David. Everyone, I apologize in advance. Apology accepted, maybe. Okay. Yeah, you've only had a year to prep for this moment. That's it. I'm kind of an idiot. It's what we're learning. I, you know, my skills are very refined. I can shovel snow, and now it's mostly melted. So now I'm just a guy on a Zoom who needs help. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, David, you saw something from the Milwaukee Bucks when they were, before they were getting one excited about eating the Clippers yesterday that made you think they might go on a big run. What did you see? It just, they, they were out of sync to start the season, as to be expected for a lot of different reasons. The, the, the immediacy of the season with very little practice time and training camp. Uh, I, they didn't, they weren't playing with joy. And I think they were getting sick of losing. And so my thought process was, uh, once they catch fire, which I didn't know when that would be, but I thought it'd be pretty soon, you're just going to see a big difference in them. And they're good enough to beat a lot of teams. They were playing good defense and all of that. Giannis had been playing very badly, and I was not someone who thought he was going to get worse suddenly. And so I, I thought he was kind of a constant and, and would get back to being that constant. And... Uh, and it didn't happen right away, for sure. They, they, um, but yeah, that's what I thought, anyways. I thought that they would almost like us against the world kind of thing, because we're sick of sucking and we shouldn't suck anymore. And we have Giannis. All right, then Thomas, some geeky stuff uh, to share about how they're playing. You want to go with the geek? Go with it. Um, well, they're seventh in expected opponent effective field goal percentage, which is a whole alphabet soup in there. But basically, it means. They're really good at limiting good looks from the opponent. They have a really good shot profile opponent wise. And what that means is these are tough shots that a lot of the teams early on in the season were hitting. And you might ask yourself, Hey, how are the Milwaukee Bucks not playing at a high level? Well, a lot of it might just be plain old luck. It's not everything, but they were allowing a ridiculous high percentage from downtown um, way higher than in the past. And in the month of February, that's come down big time. So what coaches is, is describing is a lot of joy uh, being lost early in the season. What you're seeing in the numbers is a lot of the bad numbers are regressing to the mean and their defense is getting sharper. They, they actually have a really good profile defensively. They limit a lot of basket looks and they limit a lot of um, – they do give up a lot of three pointers, but this month in February, that three point percentage has fallen uh, way down. And last night against, uh, or yesterday against the Clippers, they shot uh, 14 of 44 uh, from downtown. And a lot of those looks like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George weren't very comfortable. And I think just everything is coming together from Milwaukee Bucks, including, I think is a very big, important part of this. Drew holiday mm -hmm. is back. There was one possession down late where he rotated over on a Paul George drive and he just went walled up like he was Roy Hibbert, but like 6'4". And Paul George missed the layup and was perfectly defended. In moments like that, you're like, oh yeah, they missed they missed that guy, Drew Holiday, for 20 days doing, uh, during COVID protocols. And so now the Milwaukee Bucks are rolling. And it was such a good game last night against Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. I think absolutely they're going to you know, go on a run here because they're, they're clicking. I want to talk about Drew for a second. I just looked this up. So he was out for 10 games. Um, and the Bucks are have won the last five games mostly without him. But um, and he's back, he's he's playing limited minutes, right? So he played 18 minutes yesterday, and he was zero of three from three and one of five from the floor. But there's a sense of like Joe Holiday has like plus minus magic in his in his very body and his very being. Like, sure enough, in the dumbest stat out there, one game plus minus in his piddly 18 minutes, they were plus 10, which is like ridiculous. <laughs> It's probably with, with exactly a whole bunch of misses on his front. And this is with, the with a whole that, like, bunch of misses. Yeah. Yeah. A whole bunch of misses. Uh, yeah. Right. Despite all these bricks, like somehow he's so amazing at defense. Um, this is a team that's been first in offense most of the year. I think the Nets have passed them, but like a question mark, like why isn't the defense quite as good? And then um, now let's get super geeky with Dean Oliver's four factors. Um, I didn't intend to do this today, but Dean Oliver's four factors predict wins really well. It's from his book, Basketball and Paper, which was probably like a dozen years ago now. Um, but like they're in two of the categories on defense, the Bucks are, are league leaders. Um, and the third one, um, not so, that's a big deal. It's just this one category of expected uh, field goal percentage by their opponents is the only one where they've been bad. And now if they're going to be good at that, like this could be, 
They're the kind of, they could be the Jazz of the East, I guess, right? Oh yeah. I mean, you look at the Milwaukee Bucks. They they trade out Eric Bledsoe. You bring in Drew Holiday. Um, I mean, I think that's a big upgrade. They gave up a lot to get that, but I think on paper that's an upgrade. And Drew Holiday. They lost five games in a row during the Drew Holiday uh, sideline. So I think that's not a coincidence. I think when you see them f- at full staff, DJ Augustine, um, Doris Burke mentioned it last night, uh, yesterday, that he's he's getting himself integrated with the team. And I think they're just, they're coming together at the right time. And a lot of fluky things happened in the first half of the season or in the first like 10 or 20 games that really made that defense look bad. But you're starting to see the tie turn. I like to call a quick timeout. Mm-hmm. I think I have three more after this uh, to just celebrate Doris Burke. I almost never listen to the announcers for different reasons. A lot of times I have multiple games on and I didn't have it uh, on yesterday because I was doing some texting and making some notes on some things. I just didn't want that noise. And then I was watching some highlights on YouTube. I saw it. I watched, I'm sorry. I was watching Synergy and she's just fantastic. She's, she's the best out there right now. And we're going to show a clip in a minute here, Henry. Of, Are um, you sure? <laughs> no. <laughs> in theory, we're going to show this clip of Giannis and Duncan. to show it yet. The, the Duncan is great, and watching him prance is great. But listening to how Doris described it, I thought when I listened to it this morning, I'm like, well, that's exactly what I was thinking watching it live. So that's time is over. Uh, just to follow up on the Drew thing, the Bucks, yeah, they're 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 very dependent on their superstar. They're almost as dependent on the you know on what Drew brings, but we should not shortchange that first part. To Tom's point, it's it's a short off season. It was a, these first couple months have been a little strange for lots of reasons, and not just unique to Milwaukee. But Giannis wasn't this guy, and wasn't the guy that he'd been for two years. And now I think he's starting to get there. Oh, has been to the That's not it. You want you, do you want to hear no, Doris or no? Oh, that's the block shot one. Yeah, that's not the dunk one. I'm talking about. <laughs> well, let's just watch this one four times first because it's so amazing. Yeah. This is this is Giannis blocking oh! Zubac on a pick and roll at the rim. I I love the play by Zubac trying to dunk on him. Giannis, he, he just thought he could finish it. He almost did. And it, Giannis it, just blocked it. Yeah. Giannis at the back of Giannis's forearm hit the rim like mega hard. Yeah. Watch this. Yeah. Mm. And I really thought I really thought he might have fouled. Yeah, I, I zoom out in the face, but he didn't. He, I mean, he, it's kind of lucky that he didn't, but he didn't. The smart thing Giannis did there is he didn't swat so much as he just put that big paw up in the air. Like but you need to have that such, such, him. <laughs> yeah. You need to have such like Bam out of bio the block on uh, Jason Tatum is what I immediately thought of. Is just you have to have such strength to be able to just hey, I'm going to put my hand up here and not have it go directly into the basket. You know, so Giannis, the timing. The fortitude, like that's a big deal is he wasn't like business decision. I'm getting the F out of the way. He decided I'm going to get there at the right time and have the strength to not just get totally barreled into the rim. So incredible play. Wait, Tom, did you well, want to getting out of the go way? Deep on the play? Because yeah. well, well, Henry, can't, Henry can't change the screen, so we might as well live here for a few Yeah, we're going to be here. Henry, you can go oh, back. Oh, no. Go back, Henry. Go back if you can. Am I screwing you up to go back to that block? Oh, the block? Oh, my gosh. Because there's the <laughs> really oh, well, the limits can, of my ability here. <laughs> so, hold on. Press pause for a second. Man. So, just it's press just pause for loop. a second. So, if you watch that play again, Giannis is guarding Trey Man- uh, Terrence Mann in the left corner and right corner. I love Terrence Mann. I love him. And long thought he would be a different maker for the Clippers and one reason why they traded Landry Shamit, but he's not a shooter yet. So, Giannis is guarding him so we can play goaltender. And so what Ty, Ty Lu needs to do is change that up. So because Zubas did not think Giannis was going to be there to block it the way he was. And Giannis is playing center field. That's an e- easy adjustment going forward. I cannot have their best shot block regarding my worst shooter on that high pick and roll that they have. So that's something that they'll adjust to on that. And good job by Bud by hiding Giannis in a sense on man, who's a good driver and actually a, a pretty good playmaker, but not yet the shooter he needs to be to help them win. You know, especially come crunch time, because these kind of things will happen. Teams will hide their, they will want to hide them. They'll play their best rim protector on man and protect the rim that way. Well, and, and frankly, that play would usually work, right? Like Giannis happened to get this one, but it I wasn't mean, like, 
<laughs> yeah, it was like great. Zubac is playing great. Yeah. Yeah. There's only a few, and, and and Giannis can't block that shot every time. That's what I'm saying. That's a foul a lot. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right we can... go to this play the audio for this one. Okay. This is an Doris Burke describe Giannis and Dunk to, to ice the game. So one point game in 20 seconds. Solid inside. Great ball rotation. Middleton. Giannis downhill. So Giannis is prancing. Can you not hear her? We don't always get to see that side of him. He's so competitive and edgy. But boy, what a play. I mean, Drew makes a good decision. Ball switch sides. And Giannis coming downhill. Look out. I love what she said. He's playing with joy. And you don't typically see that side of him because of his competitiveness and his edginess. And that, I, th- I feel like that was part of their problem early on is the way the world he felt was on his shoulders. They had been disappointing twice in a row in the postseason when he won MVP. And he was just all machine. Kawhi can play that way. Kawhi really can be like a Terminator that way. I think Giannis needs to have that joy. And when I saw him prance, Live, I, I didn't have the audio on. I'm like, okay, like that's the guy that they need to have. It also relaxes everybody else who's not nearly as good as him on their team and, and thus even more stressed. Right. Imagine being his teammate, like being Jordan's teammate and losing big games, right? He's doing everything. So if they can keep manufacturing that kind of prancing and joy, pretty good. Pretty good for the Milwaukee. What do you think about dancing like that when you're down 20? Good? Not good. oh this gets to my favorite thing which is it does chemistry breed winning or does weaning breed chemistry um you know does is Giannis when he's down by 20 points and prancing down the floor galloping with a big smile on my face is that gonna create wins down the line or is it the opposite is he's doing that dunk and then prancing like he's he's feeling great he needs to get that joy back um, I, it's, it's a great debate is whether chemistry breeds winning or, or winning breeds chemistry. I'm always on the, on the side of winning breeds chemistry. It's very hard to point to the fact, the, the evidence of a team with a great locker room, with all these media stories about how great the locker room is during a five game losing streak. Like yes. you never hear about that, but now you're getting into my wheelhouse. Mm. Okay. What I always will say to teams, and I say this a little bit of anger in my voice, but I'm talking to the teams, not necessarily my team. I'm not fucking impressed when you're all high five on the bench and your team's getting a dunk in a high school, pro game, college game, whatever. Where are you when you're down 20 with five to play? What kind of teammate are you then? Where are you when a teammate strikes out? Because my son, you play baseball. Where are you when a, when a pitcher gives up a grand slam? If you're not having his back, man, I don't need you going mm. forward. Mm. If that's how we're going to build our winners. Is where are you? If you slow, don't do it in the spot. When our wives are at their worst, for whatever reason going on in our lives, that's when we stand up, right? That's when we say, I got you. And if you can't do that, who needs you? You're really not needed, all right? That's so what, we're saying, what we're saying here, Coach, is um, when Henry's screwing up on the producing of the show, yeah. we have to be for him and cheering him on and giving him high Damn, so that straight. Control. That's exactly oh, what yeah. he's saying. <laughs> it ain't hard to be a good teammate. It ain't hard to be a good teammate. Honestly, and- yeah, but David, I can I can convince Tom a hundred percent with a Wake Forest anecdote, and I don't think we can beat that. Um, Tom, are you familiar with Wake Forest? <laughs> no. What is that? Um, so I literally have a Wake Forest football right here, <laughs> right signed by the football coach. I, I, I did eight. not know they played football. Wake Forest. Oh, they went to the Orange Bowl my senior year. Went to Miami. Yeah. Do you know uh, Florida? Florida by chance? Oh my god! Um, football. What? What did they do? Did they get to the Orange Bowl that year? Sorry. Um, anyway, go ahead. Carry but, on, Henry. What I'm saying is, David, Wake Forest, the fuck up. Um, no, I'm yeah. just kidding. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so, Wake all right, so Forest. David has fully convinced me. It took it took a decade, but he's fully convinced me. That the definition of leadership is breathing spirit into others. Right. So this is the chemistry thing that can happen on a bad team, and this is the chemistry thing that can be. Uh, it was Dave Odom, right? Who was Tim Duncan's coach yeah. at Wake Forest. Yeah. So this That's is great. Dave Odom's hollering at Randolph Childress in practice. And Tim Duncan reaches his hand under Randolph Childress's chin and lifts his face up. And later I asked Tim Duncan about this and I'm like, wait, were you like 
hey, out of respect, listen to coach? Or were you like, hey, chin up, right? Like, and, and Tim was like, like, what? Like, of course it was the second one. Like, he couldn't even fathom that he would play a part in making Randall feel bad, right? So to me, like, this to me is the thing that can happen on a good team or a bad team. Just like, we think of leadership very often as who's most correct. Kobe screaming at Jeremy Lin in front of reporters, right? Like, like my teammates fucking suck is not inspiring, right? But like, hey man, like you're good at basketball. Like you got this, don't get down. Like, I think that might make a 13 win, 13 win team into a 17 win team, et cetera, and so on. And next thing you know, you're Drew Holiday and you're plus 10 just for checking into the game. <laughs> you're well, great about- at sliding between video clips, Henry. You're great at it. <laughs> Get up, buddy. Think about you don't have to lie. <laughs> Think about how supposed to turn that team around where they went uh, uh, at 11 and 30 and then went 30 and 11. It wasn't all puppy dogs and ice cream. It's just, you got to keep guys, you got to keep the core together. Keep believing, trust what we're doing. But what, what can't happen is get people to buy in on that and not be decent to each other in the process. Right. Like you, you have to have that. And so I don't think Tom, you're wrong. Of course, when he can breed chemistry, it doesn't always. It also breeds lots of fighting. Talk, I love talking to players when they're on hot streaks, not just individually, but team-wise, and, and reminding them, hey, let me know when you start seeing me splintering, when guys start thinking arrogantly, or, hey, I'm not getting the reps that someone else is getting, even though they're winning. Like, I always tell players, you can never go complain about playing time to your coach on a win streak. You got to keep that shit to yourself, because it's working. And you are only going to piss people off. But they want to, because they want to feel like they could do more, especially when things are going. Human, human brain is a fragile thing, as we know. So you have to have that, that fun. And I think the Bucs have done this for years is I, I trust them. I trust Bud that way. You can, you can criticize playoffs all you want, but they're going to do this shit year to year to year with these guys there. Giannis is there. Bud's got a thing working out. They find a way, and, but they're not deep enough to, to live high on the hog without, uh, without Drew. I wanted to point out one play from that game where – Kawhi Leonard is. Do you want me to show it? Because I don't think I can. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm okay. gonna, you know what? I got to pick my spots with you, Henry. Know, know your talent. Know your role. Know your personnel. <laughs> I got to get his hand in your role, Henry. <laughs> um, so Kawhi is just killing the the Bucks on post ups, like these back you down, spin move, boom, boom, boom. Then Giannis and Adekumpo is guarding Paul George, and they're switching a whole bunch just to like figure out how do they get away from Giannis, right? And Kawhi Leonard has, I think it was Drew Holiday, might have been Dante DiVincenzo, but Kawhi Leonard is about to take a pull up and Paul George doesn't go to the corner when he's guarded by Giannis. So Giannis is playing Rover at the top of the key. Like, I'm going to block this shit into the front row as soon as Kawhi goes up and Kawhi goes up for the, for the mid range J and Paul George is standing on the wing. He's not in the corner. So Giannis can double up on Kawhi. And as soon as Kawhi goes up for the, for the mid-range A, Giannis just comes out from behind him and swats it away. And I'm like, how do you defend a fadeaway mid-range jumper from Kawhi? It's just about unguardable. Well, when you have Giannis on the floor and you don't have his guy having the smarts to like get out, get way over to the corner because Kawhi's going to block it. That's how you defend it is you have a Giannis and a Dekumpo out on the floor who's able to swat that away. And, and Kawhi recovered and then threw it off the backboard in like the final minute of the game. And it's like those things, you need to have a superstar who's locked in defensively and has kind of this chip on his shoulder of, I, I want to take this team further than where we were last year. And you know who also feels that way is the Clippers and who won that game yesterday. It was Giannis. Um, David's about to tell us that the shot is usually blocked by the guy you don't see coming. Yeah. I'm so thankful that you remember that. <laughs> so I've told, I've told you guys over the years that uh, the smartest basketball nugget of wisdom I ever heard was Jimmy Brown saying, or writing, uh, you set screens for one reason, that's to make defenders think. And I quote it 800 times a day. Uh, and anything I ever do regarding basketball, I've always wanted to come up with something smart <laughs> because that is such a smart thing. And yeah, just over the years, I noticed, God, the best shot blockers are the ones that ha- are going to help the block because in the NBA, they're so talented offensively that if they know you're coming, they will find a way to draw the foul. Not always, often, right? And that's a killer for shot blockers. 
when they don't see you coming, you, like you just described, they are, I mean, it's like a hawk, you know, capturing a little baby dove. They just got no <laughs> shot, right? They got no shot. I, I just, and they're ugly blocks, like violent blocks. You don't see violent blocks typically when they're doing it to the guy they're guarding. Right. Because right. they got to be careful. But when they don't see you coming, it's easy picking. It's four guys like Giannis, these super long guys, whatever. Uh, yeah, so um, that's team defense. That's why I've always liked pairing Marcus Saul with uh, a high flying guy, which they haven't always done in Memphis either, because he is such a, a paint protector, a space protector. You have to work your ass off to get a shot off on him, and you forget about the other four dudes on the court potentially. Oh man, exactly. LeBron and AD. Like, exactly. can you think of two guys who are more perfect for the chase down? Like, you don't see him come and block than them. Yep. You're worried about the guy that's guarding you. You forget about the gigantic athlete that's coming. That's a recipe for big wins. Yeah, big wins. It's not in our rundown, but um, the chat. Uh, thank you, Greg, is um, thinking me. I think we should take a minute to talk about Lauren Woods. I didn't. Oh, I didn't coming, but... take hey, the knife you know, out from my back, man. You know how well about... I know Lauren Woods. David knows Lauren Woods really well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started coaching Lauren in summer summers at Five Star when he was 15 from Cardinal wow. Ritter, Cardinal Ritter in St. Louis. He and Chris Carrawell, who went to Duke. Yeah. Then I had Chris Carrawell coming out for the NBA draft. And then because of Chris, I think some other people, when Lauren was struggling in the NBA, they sent him to me. And in fact, he bought a home in Tampa. Can you recap his career? Where did he play, David? He played in he played for the Kings. He played for the he went on. Oh, we're gonna look he up. was a lot of play Lithuania. Uh, it's not so in the he, NBA though, he, is it? No, he went to Wake and then uh Transferred. And then he went to Arizona and did really well in Arizona. Yeah. Uh Lauren was one of those guys, he's a very nice guy who um he's one of those guys that played the game well and mostly because he was just so tall and long. Like he was a he was a great player, guys, in high school and college. At Arizona, he was a good player, not a great player, but he was a good player. But to so replace him, that, Miami, um, Toronto, Houston. There you go. Yeah, because of him, I watched the game where Kobe scored 81, right. and I thought Sam Mitchell should be banned forever from the NBA because he allowed it to happen. But that's a whole other. He almost wanted it to happen to punish the guys because I watched that game and I just couldn't believe it. I was watching, and it wasn't just because Kobe was amazing. But yeah, Lauren, listen, you have to love to, you have to want to work. You really have. To, this game is so hard. Isn't how tall you are, and I don't think Lauren loved that. He never had to grind because he was so tall and talented. Uh, and he played with Chris in high school. That helped because they were so dominant. But yeah, the one was, that's, it tells you how old I am. I remember when he was 15 years old and he's long and out of the league. You may have opened a little bit of an interesting topic there too. <laughs> with the, I'm quoting Caleb from the chat in all caps. Go into more detail on the 81 point game. <laughs> oh, I just, I watched the game live and I didn't really pay that much attention to how many points Kobe was scoring as much as I was wondering, why aren't they changing anything? And then, and I, I, I think Mr. Mitchell is a very nice man. I've done his radio show before. I think he's a fantastic assistant coach and a terrible head coach. There are some coaches who don't like the team and you can see it. And he didn't like that team. And maybe he shouldn't have liked that team. I, I didn't love that team. I didn't love having to watch that team play. But you've got to bail teams out sometimes and change things up and, and not let them be the victim of an 81-point game. Because they had no chance to guard him with what they were doing. He didn't change anything. That, that bothers me. It's not, it's on the players, but they can only do what they can do. A coach has to change that up a little bit. And I just never watched it live thinking, like he's a score 100. <laughs> it's just they can't guard him. And they weren't doing anything different. I, as a coach, our job is to have no pride. Hey, this ain't working. At some point, you got to click the panic button and go to something else. And they just didn't do that. That's the opposite of your lesson in leadership from earlier in the show. Yeah. 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 It's almost like I told you guys. Like, right. It's almost like even Stan, I told you guys this thing. Like, we know. We're well aware, Coach. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tom wants uh, some hate mail. Is. Tom's dying for some hate mail. Uh, why, don't, why don't you let her rip on the Knicks, Tom? <laughs> yes. Fired up about this. Mark Stein wrote a great piece in the New York Times of all places to write a great story about the New York, about the New York Knicks. Um, the headline to me is a quote, an amazing quote from Spike Lee that says, I see orange and blue skies again. Spike Lee is excited. They're 8, 17. They're fourth in the Eastern Conference. They have a positive net rating. They're second in defensive efficiency. The Knicks 
are back, boys, and I'm here to tell you it's not going to be long. They're not back for long. They are not long for this world in the NBA, and I'll tell you why. That defense, to me, is the backbone of why they got here, is their second in defensive efficiency, and I think it's smoke and mirrors. They are number one in opponent effective field goal percentage, which is just effective uh, field goal percentage weighted by threes. They're doing an amazing job so far of making sure those baskets aren't going in. But the problem with that is I think it's a lot of luck. The opponents have had the worst three point field goal percentage against the Knicks by far. And studies show time and time again, that teams can't control opponent three point field goal percentage nearly as much as we'd like to think so. And secondly, Like Tom Thibodeau's defenses, they go strong side. They make sure you don't get to the rim. And I was waiting to look at the numbers today to be like, oh, this is exactly a Tom Thibodeau defense. They're probably walling off the paint and they're not getting any, giving up any looks at the basket. That's not true. They just haven't been able to convert a lot of these layups. They're 10th. They give up the 10th most baskets at uh, within three feet, the New York Knicks. So they give up a lot of three pointers, fifth most in the NBA. And they give up a lot of baskets at the rim, but the shots aren't going in. And I just feel like this is smoke and mirrors, not just because of the effective field goal percentage. They're doing a great job so far of making sure those baskets don't go in. But I think that is going to regress to the mean. And that defense, I mean, you look at who are the great defenders on that team. You can't really point to what more than two or three. And I'm just thinking, this is going to fall like a house of cards. And in the next couple of weeks, when they play good opposing offenses, which they haven't done this season, at dunksandthrees.com, they ranked the uh, they adjust your defensive rating by your opponent and the strength of schedule by opponent. And they're, they move down to fourth, okay? So they go from a second defensive efficiency, yay, down to a fourth. And if your defense isn't as good as you think, I just, I just think the, the New York Knicks are going to fall back down to earth And everyone's excited about fourth in the Eastern conference, but if they're in the West, they'd be ninth with that record. So I just think this Knicks thing is fun, but I would not bet on the Knicks. If you're in this euphoric state, like Spike Lee saying, I see orange and blue skies. And I'm saying, I see a lot of red in that sky. Whoa. All right. I don't typically, (laughs) I don't typically argue with Tom. I happen to almost always agree with him. And I'm really, not arguing much here because I think he's right. I think his the big picture is like I, like if they're a stock, I wouldn't be buying. I, I I may hold, right? See, I mean, over the course of a season or two or three, I don't I don't know that this franchise isn't on the. I think they might be on the right track in terms of decision making and things. But Tom's not wrong that that it's not time to be euphoric. And yes, his point on the West and East is exactly right. This is not a great team. I don't think it's even a very good team. It might be just be good in part because there's a lot of bad teams. However, I will I will give Knicks fans this glimmer of hope. All right, and I, I just will give you a 30 second story. When I first started coaching, I was hired to teach man to man defense for a coach that only coached zone before, but the team was very athletic and was always going to be. And our first year, I thought we I was 22, but I know what good defense looked like. I thought, and teams were scoring a ton of points against us. And it really was confusing to me. And I, over this offseason, I watched a lot of videotape and realized, to Tom's point right now, without knowing these metrics, we actually were, were playing pretty good defense, but everyone seemed so happy to play against us because they had been bad in years past. And even though we were guarding my thought pretty well, they were just making shots against us that I wasn't used to teams making four years early when I was a high school player. And with less athletes, we were a good defensive team. And so that offseason, I made a decision. I wrote this in my book, in the chapter of my book, I asked the head coach, can I run the varsity in the spring leagues? And he has all the great teams from our county. He said, yep. And I told our, I met with our team. I said, guys, we're playing, we're playing basically Nolan Richardson, 40 minutes of hell. Full court, pressure man, every step. All I want is for teams to hate to play us. I didn't even care if we won. I just want them hating to say, God, we got to play Dixie Holland today. And that's what we did. We ended up going undefeated against high major players all over the place. And won three championships in the next four years. And I realized then that just by creating that angst, they missed shots. They, even when they were wide open, they were expecting someone to come. And so I think I watched tape on Knicks all weekend, Tom, including this morning. You asked the question, who's a great defensive player? I don't know who's great. I'm curious what Taylor's got on his thing. 
But RJ Barrett is getting better. He's long. He, he's not great. Nerlens Noel is everywhere, right? Yeah, he's good. Long, he's good. Yeah, he's yeah. right. He's good. Derrick Rose is hustling. Like Derrick Rose is chasing guys all around ball screens and racing to cut him back off. There's a mindset for them. Uh, your point of three point shooting is exactly right in, in aggregate. But we also know that early high hand contest, lower players percentages on average, like four point four percent. Some there's some number uh, that just getting up early and high. Well, that's a teachable point. I'm not saying the Knicks are the best at right. doing it, but they're better at it. They're fouling too much, amazingly enough. If you if I asked you who were the best three teams at not fouling, Clippers. I'm not sorry, uh, Bucks, Lakers, Jazz, the three best defensive teams. That's not a coincidence, right? But how's these for stat? 10th in points allowed off turnovers. So top 10, not amazing. Third in points in the paint. To your point, Tom, I'll get to it. Third in fast break points allowed. Fourth in second chance points. Now, some of that's tied into your statistic about EFG percentage. In other words, if they're missing shots, well, it counts as a miss in every category. But if they're contesting guys, and yep. there's just, and I watch them play, and this is why we can't just look at stats, and I know none of you guys just look at stats. There's a feeling you get watching the Knicks play. There's an energy about their defense that there hasn't been for years. That counts for something. I agree with Tom. I do not think this is long-term champion. It's the beginning of what I think can be a good team. Not necessarily this year. They've got to get more talent, for sure, right? But if they can start with building a great defense in terms of effort, yeah, teams will start shooting better and start coaching up guys more, play better offense. They don't turn the ball over. They're keeping guys away from the rim more or less uh, on the glass too. It's the foundation. And Spike hasn't had that for a long time. Yeah. So at least he's got something, right? For sure. And I think, I think the Knicks are a great example in – this is why we play the games. I mean, if you had told me that March 1st, 2021, that they would be ahead of the standings after making that Chris Tapps Porzingis trade, after Toronto, be Boston, ahead right. of Toronto, Boston, Miami, and <laughs> Dallas, like yeah. Luka Doncic, MVP right. candidate, starting the all-star game, and yet the Knicks are ahead of them, right? Like that that's amazing. And that's You're definitely right. worth cheering about. It's just, would you go to this, the NBA stock market, whatever that is, gam gamble on them and say, this is going to be a sign of things to come. I'm shorting that stock. And I think when you look at their effective field goal percentage defense is number one in the league, meaning they're the best at making sure that t the opponent does not make their shots. However, the quality of looks that the opponents are getting are the fourth best in the NBA. So they have really good looks on paper, but they have the worst shooting percentage on those really good looks. I just don't think that that's sustainable. And when you look at a really good defense that is sustainable, it's they're forcing tough looks, they're not fouling, and they're cleaning up the glass. And I just think that effective field goal percentage, the ability to limit opponents from scoring the basketball on those shots, I just think it's going to come back down to earth at some point. And it's just it's really good to see Derrick Rose and all these guys being super active defensively. Um, and that's, that's Thibodeau. That's motivating the guys to play hard on, def yeah. on defense. Anytime you say the Knicks defense is top five in the NBA in, in defensive efficiency, that's an incredible achievement. I'm just not buying it long term. So your, your argument is going to come down at least a little bit. I, I, I have no argument with you on that. It's going to come down. Yeah. They're not going to see payments. This reminds me of um, Kevin Arnovitz was here in New Jersey. Um, when the Clippers had a good half a year with Baron Davis. Baron Davis was new to the Clippers. That's how old I am. Um, but, uh, but and, and I was basically, I was taking Thompson. I'm like, like, I'm like, you're not winning a championship like this. You know, like, and, and there were cap issues and blah, blah, blah. And, and they weren't that good, right? It was a little bit of smoke and mirrors. They were good, but not um, like contender status. And I talked for half an hour about why I was so right. And then Kevin's like, like, you gotta understand, like, I'm a Clippers fan. Like, Nothing we've done has mattered ever. You know, like, like, like now we're like, maybe if you squint could make a Western conference finals, like that's fantastic. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm celebrating. Right. And like, part of me is like, I think maybe like Tom Thibodeau is the Baron Davis in this story. Like, Hey, there's somebody here who's good at his job on a team that has been self-sabotaging every five minutes for decades. Right. Like, like they didn't blow their cap space this summer and they have some decent young players like you can, Julius Randle's playing better than expected. 
you know, Emmanuel Quickly is fun to watch. Everything isn't dog shit. <laughs> like, like that's yeah. new. <laughs> so, this is, so just to extrapolate Tom's point, um, the mistake they would make is, is over uh, investing on what's happening right now. Right. Where suddenly they think they are contenders, they just one more deal. No, they're eight moves away, seven moves away from right. really being in that conversation. Keep building, figure out who's part of your culture. What yep. you know, are you developing a guy that has more attraction elsewhere than he does here? And therefore, can we get something better for him in return? But that kind of thing happens sometimes. Yeah, they're they're still a ways away, but the, the foundation is being built. Uh, they just have to trust that, that it'll continue, and who knows if they will. And, um, you know, Mitchell Robinson, I just want to look at that. He has had hand surgery and is out. They'll reevaluate after the break. But, like, he's probably the good defender, right? Like, he's probably the one that we'd point to as, like, a difference maker. And I would guess. So Mitchell? One. Yeah. It's, yeah, he's their best. He's their best defender. Yeah, right. So he's New, Orleans is, New Orleans is really New Orleans a great really. backup defensively. So. Right, right. But, um, but they'd be better. You know, we'll see if Mitchell Robinson is back 100%, then maybe Tom's projections get a little rosier. I don't know. For sure, for sure. Um, uh, Stein Stein did a great job on the piece, also because he brought in a lot the of the, second, that's right. Yeah, right. Stein's piece uh, brought up the fact that like Leon Rose hasn't been super trigger happy on deals. Like they sat on the cap space. He's been very quiet behind the scenes, not you know beating his chest over anything. He's been notoriously hard to reach, um, and it's it does feel like something's changing. Um, over there with the Knicks and he came he took over in the jo- to get the job and it was a mess a total mess with the Knicks and the Thibodeau defense has been great uh they're they're 18 and 17 with with Derrick Rose they're seven and three with the fifth best net rating in the NBA they got a really tough schedule coming up after the break against Milwaukee a couple times the Nets the Sixers so we'll see. We'll see about the Knicks. Uh, they, if they can survive that gauntlet right after the All-Star break, I am totally changing my tune. I just think those offenses um, will do much better than what we've seen with the Detroit Pistons recently. No, I'm sure you're right. Um, I think the key skill for the, for the Leon Rose, William Wesley administration might not be like scouting. It might be James Dolan management, right? Like they convince yeah. the most itchy trigger finger, like big spending crazy pants live today yolo owner in nba history to just do nothing for a while and like ah (laughs) like that's the sound of improvement (laughs) like you can kind of see like previous regime maybe or if james dolan is running the show he might be like hey i heard blake griffin is available what if (laughs) it still might happen it still might happen it might be julius randall for blake griffin here any day (laughs) (laughs) please no (laughs) no Good thing no, Blake no, Griffin no, no, didn't no. go to Kentucky. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay, uh, David, you want to talk? You you have diagnosed something wrong with the Boston Celtics. Oh, no, I didn't diagnose it, but I agree with it. I listened right. to so Zach Lowe wrote about the Celtics last week, and then he had Brian Scalabrini on the show. And Brian is an analyst, I guess, for maybe he does TV for them. I don't NBC know. Sports yeah. Boston. Oh, okay. Yep. So um, you know, smart guy, obviously, and knows the game. And he they they were talking about how Boston doesn't get to the rim. And uh, Scalabrini was actually really being critical of these guys that, that talk about Jalen and Jason, the two best players, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, are just so happy to get their little side tip, you know, uh, mid-range jumpers and the quick pull-ups and whatever. And it's funny, I've been thinking a lot about this. The as so, Supposedly, I'm the, one of the first, about the first guys to create this player development business, right? And I did a terrible job. Because most people doing this think it's all about trick shots instead of about how to win basketball games, right? And, and I'm not at all suggesting Jason Tim, Jalen Brown, and to win games. But I do think there is a feeling of falling in love with the style cool thing instead of sometimes just going to the freaking rim and get a bucket or get a foul when you're that talented. It reminds me of something, one of my all-time favorite memories as a Lakers fan growing up was a, a, a playoff series, and I don't remember anymore, but I think it was the finals. I'm almost sure it was the finals. And Byron Scott was our shooter. Do you guys remember? Well, yeah, you're both pretty old enough to remember it. And Magic Johnson wanted him to go to the hole. And by the way, Byron Scott was an amazing athlete. Do you guys remember? Uh-huh. But he, he was a beautiful shooter. And he would drive to the rim. He would make a shot, and Magic would high-five him. 
he would drive to the rim and get fouled. And back then, they were hammering guys, right? And Magic would lose it in excitement. For That's what I'm talking about. You could see him say that. And I learned from watching Magic what leadership looked like. Because all of a sudden, Byron Scott was a rim attacker. And it was a mindset the Lakers got. And they won the championship that year. And Byron was great. And the, the, the Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum combination, nobody can stay in front of them. But I, and I made some news to Henry over the weekend. But I will tell you, when I have talked to NBA players who play the Boston Celtics and want guidance on how do I guard those guys, I literally said, this is before this weekend, uh, don't cut them off when they're driving and give them a mid-range. I call that giving them a bubble of space. That's what they want. Stay attached to them, even if they beat you a little bit, and just continue to stay attached to their hip and hope for help for sure. If you don't, if you don't get help, you're probably in some trouble. Right? Those guys are great finishers. But they don't want to go to the rim as often as they want to stop and pop. And if you race to cut them off and cut that angle off, which is how you defend most guys, then they're going to live and die on that mid-range, and it's a good shot for them. you got to make them drive in a traffic. They don't want to do it. So as the break happens and maybe they started to staff a little bit of metrics, if they realize, guys, we got to just attack the rim more, those two guys can do it. And and if Kemba has been out plenty, he's not been very good when he's been back. That'll help solve a problem a little bit too. Although he's not somebody to get to the rim a bunch. He's a tiny guy. He's going to stop the top. On that note, yeah. two years ago, last season in Charlotte, when he started the All-Star game in Charlotte, Kemba Walker got to the cup 25% of his field goal attempts. Okay. This year, that's down to 10%. Yeah. And that tells you a lot about, I mean, he has a high percentage at the rim, but he, he's just not getting there. Um, and that might be his knee. That might be uh, his role on the team might have been different than what it was in Charlotte for sure. But I think it's a big deal that uh, not only him, but also yeah. Jason Tatum has had a, a tough time getting to the rim at a high rate. And he And if you look at his shot chart, Jason Tatum, it's just, it's like Kobe. It's just shots everywhere. You know, it's, it's in the mid range. It's in the, you know, seven to 10, uh, seven to 10, the floaters around the paint, but he's not getting to the actual cup. And you know, coach, like the difference between getting a, a layup versus a floater from 10 feet away or eight feet away, that's like a 40% shot going all the way to like a, a 80% shot. And for Jason Tatum, he's, he's doing those little dinks around the basket um, floaters or, or just turnarounds and not actually getting to the cup. And it's been so, it's been such a big problem for the Celtics is getting to the free throw line, having those high efficiency shots around the rim and they just haven't been able to get it. And um, it's just, it's, it's one of the things that's plaguing them is having a healthy Kemba Walker, number one. And secondly, having Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in their all-star years, they still have room for improvement and they're young. So they'll get there. Higher percentage and more chance to get fouled. Closer gets to the rim, the better chance for him to call a foul. And so you want to get those free throw numbers up. That's always a big, big factor. Right, DeMar DeRozan used to not get – people don't remember, but look back to his early years, he wasn't getting fouled. And then when he became an all-star, he was living at the line. It's a big – it's hard to guard these guys unless you bail them out offensively by not trying to, to attack them all the way. Like, and I'm all for threes. For sure I'm all for threes. One of the ways you get all the threes, just like with a boxer – the more you hit him in the stomach, the more his jaws exposed at some point. You get to that rim and, and they got to protect the rim. You can shoot threes. Or if you're making a bunch of threes and they're spread out, you can go to the rim. Either one coming first is fine with me. I don't believe in inside out. I believe in the contrast. I don't care if it's inside out or outside in, the contrast matters. You can't take away both. If you can, you're the Jazz. Okay? Right? You, you're the Bucks when they were playing great defense because there's a Rudy Gobert Giannis at the rim. It's very hard to do both. Um. I think we want to talk before we bring Gerard in. Let's talk about the Heat for a second. Um, no longer seen as terrible at basketball. Yeah, they're hot. Uh, I watched them play a couple of times over the weekend. You know, I'm gonna have time to talk about. They're healthy, and it makes a difference when you're healthy. But that's an example over the years. If you ride off Miami under Eric Spolstra, you're not paying attention. But you're not paying attention. They and and it's and for every owner who's listening, which is laughable, but. In theory, maybe they could Drod, get a team. Drod, get a team. <laughs> uh, have a general manager or president support your coach the way Pat Riley does in Earth Culture. And let your coach coach. And so Eric is not a surprise that Coach Spo finds a way and they don't quit before it's too late. And so now they're healthy. Go ahead, Tom. They're playing really good again. Jimmy Butler, 
is really good at basketball and yeah. having him on your team playing basketball is really important to winning oh, basketball okay. games. Yeah. That, that's my yeah. analysis. Here's the numbers behind that. Jimmy Butler on the floor for the Miami Heat. They are 13 and eight this season in those 21 games. And without Jimmy Butler on the floor, they're four and nine. So the dichotomy of Jimmy Butler with and without with the Miami Heat is super important. And not just that, he's a leader. Uh, he's their, their, their crunch time guy. And I think a lot of those shots that Jimmy Butler takes that when he leaves the floor gets soaked up by someone, it's probably Tyler Hero or Kendrick Nunn, who are really solid role players and shot creators, but they're not Jimmy Buckets, okay? Um, defensively, he organizes things. He's, he, he's a grinder. Like if you want a superstar on your team, you want him to have the kind of effort plays that Jimmy Butler does. And so he does so much for that team. And now that he's healthy and he's out on the floor, and I know he didn't play last game, but Goran Dragic did. Yeah. And those three, Goran Dragic, Bam Adebayo, and Jimmy Butler have played in 10 games for the Miami Heat this season. And I said it a month ago, said it two months ago. Do not write this team off. When they are healthy, they're going to be as good as just about any Eastern Conference team, and they're showing it right now. It's uh, every year there are these teams, right, that were like, I mean, the Heat a year ago, same thing, right? Yeah, right. Same thing. Um, actually, when we talk about the Celtics just now, too, I'm like, they're, of course, going to be making tons of noise in the playoffs, right? Do we all agree on that? <laughs> like, the Celtics are going to be like, oh, I pulled it out. They turn it around. Kemba, Kemba's got to be okay. Yep. They're in trouble yeah. without Kemba. Yeah. Yeah. They have a deal. There's a deal. They, they, can, do, they can do some things. I, I wonder, I, don't, I know this wasn't on the document, but Tom, do you have an opinion on where Andre Drummond might end up? Might end up? I think he might be. be a buyout guy and then where might he end up? No, so Bobby Marks has a great story out um, at ESPN.com uh, about why, or basically every fit, every team breakdown on what they're you know looking at going into the trade deadline. And he mentioned that there's a few reasons why Andre Drummond is not getting bought out. It's something to do with bird rights, that the team acquiring him can't ex- go over the cap to re-sign him. But basically a buyout for Andre Drummond is is a bad idea. So the, Cle- the Cavaliers are going to try like hell to make sure that they trade him, Andre Drummond, because his value tanks if yeah. he's in a buyout situation. So we'll see. Um, but I think, I think Dallas is a really interesting uh, place for him uh, because of Chris Stapps Porzingis' defense. He played much better over the weekend defensively. Yeah. But um, I think Andre Drummond makes some sense there. And they have an extra incentive to make sure that they do really well this season because that pick is going to the Knicks. And I know that can't be everything, the driving factor for them. But uh, I, I expect the, the Dallas Mavericks to upgrade uh, here at the deadline. And it might be Andre Drummond. As a very suave and confident Zoom host, I have welcomed Drod Hector to the conversation. <laughs> suave. That's something I didn't expect you to say. How about you describing Gerard? Thank you, Coach and Henry. What an excellent job you did coming out of the break and pulling me in here. Well done, sir. Very good job. So I just chemistry is breeding winning. Yep. <laughs> hey, Dry. Any any Knicks thoughts on what we said? No, I mean you guys are right on. Look, I, I was talking to some Knicks fans on a couple of shows recently, and like, oh, like, they're unavoidable. They're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want them to be happy, right? But I, I, to Henry's point, I also want them to be realistic, right? Like, okay, to Tom's point, it may not be sustainable, but we do play in the Eastern Conference, so you might be able to fool around and find yourself into that 10 playing game. That's a nice place for you to be because you've been disastrous for 20 plus years. That's okay. But what you're doing is, as Coach said, the foundation's being built. And to your point, Henry, if they can keep itchy trigger fingers, James Dolan, to calm the fuck down and just let things build slowly, I think they'll be all right. But if he starts, oh, wait, we got a chance, it's over. Like, all you got to do is, you know, make one silly trade, blow up your cap, and it's over again. And you you, you ruin it. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like you're skating out on the ice, but the further you go out and it hasn't been that cold, it's getting a little thinner out there. So let's keep James closer to the shore and not way out towards the middle part of that ice. <laughs> I like that analogy. Um, can I get you guys to talk about my friend Erica Van Stone's couple of tweets this morning? I thought this was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I will read them now. Um, I would show them, but I don't know how. She said, here is my call to action for sports during Women's History Month. Don't share inspiring stories of women who have persevered. Tell us what you are planning to do to make the industry more welcoming and equitable for women in sports. 
The reason women have to persevere in the first place is because sports is a hostile place for women, especially trans women, gender expansive humans, and women of color. Sports can do better. I mean, uh, first of all, I love Erica Van Stone, so that's number one. Yeah, she's not just your friend, she's our friend. <laughs> number- You're gonna claim that. <laughs> okay. Number two, okay. I mean, she's dead on right it's it's what i talk about when we talk about oh look the magical negro it's like like, the reason why like oprah and Barack Obama are so amazing because these people have to work so hard to get to this point point is it shouldn't have to be that way right like the outlier should not be your example of oh look look how amazing this is no they're outliers that's why it's fucked up right we need to make this more inclusive so that those stories become more of the norm and less of Oh my God, look, you can persevere through anything. Look at this person, look at that person. You're not. Like, right? Like, the reason why there's only one of those is because it's the system screwed up. So well done by Erica Van Stone pointing that out. I have a, I want to make a house of cards analogy. You, are you guys all house Ooh. of cards people? Um, I saw the first two seasons. Do you yes. know, I'm talking about Raymond Tusk. Anybody? Raymond Tusk. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, he sticks out of my head a little bit as like the man behind the man behind the man or whatever, right? He's like the, the very deep pocketed guy who, if you're going to run things, you have to have Raymond Tusk on board basically, right? And why? Well, because that's just how the world is, right? And to me, there's a little bit of a discrepancy here, which is like, as we're wanting change, either Raymond Tusk keeps his job and reshuffles who he meets with, or Raymond Tusk is worried about his job, right? And to me, like, a lot of what happens when we have like progress in sports is really like there's Raymond Tusk and then there's like the politics, whatever. Those are all the same people. And they're just like, all right, so, you know, change someone in the org, right? Let someone else be the face of a thing. Like that's not really to me making the environment better for different kinds of people, right? That's like, that's keeping Raymond Tusk in a gig, right? That's the main point of that exercise, right? And like, I don't know, like maybe a WNBA team had like, Somebody we've never heard of who's wealthy for reasons we can't explain uh, by the Atlanta team, but they're like, no, 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 it was like, oh, wonderful <laughs> story of, you know, diversity. And it's like, maybe it was, maybe it, I don't want to, I wasn't inside it. I don't know. But like, to me, like, I don't think Raymond Tusk is like, oh, the world has changed for me because of the Atlanta dream ownership has shifted. It's like, I think he's very secure. And um, this was when, when Davis turned I wrote this obituary that was, I think the most read thing in, in, in true of history. And a lot of it was like, he created the WNBA and is generally seen as like a total champion of women because of it. And there's a lot of merit in that, but also like I'm writing all this crazy crap about Jeffrey Epstein and the NBA because of the same relationships that David built. Like, why am I talking about Jeffrey fucking Epstein in the NBA at all? Why is he within a hundred thousand miles of this league? Like, well, cause you know, there's some Raymond Tuskin going on there. It wasn't great for women, right? So to me, I'm like a little bit like, is it the environment for women? Or is it the, you know, is it the, a couple of gigs, right? It's a different thing. Well, the, the, the world is better for the proletariat with no Raymond Tusk. No, no now we're getting, you said the words wrong. Now we're going to get like. Turn this zoom off in two seconds. Sorry, guys. <laughs> But right, no Tusk, no no Jeff Bezos, and oh look, all of a sudden diversity and inclusion looks a lot better, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. To, to me, it goes to um, it, it, we all have to do our part one one step at a time, and 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 to Henry's thing about uh, you got to be shedding light on it. Like that, we need those spotlights where where they're being shown because it's they want darkness, right? Um, and. Uh, it's also a mindset, and this is just, I can just speak from personal experience. When I'm with, I used to go to places and watch events, I haven't done it in a year. Uh, when you hear guys in, in your group talking about, oh, it's a woman's game, like, like I used to tell people not use the N-word around me. And then, uh, and they stopped, because I said it with the serious, serious in my voice. That was when I was in my 20s. And then I stopped using the B-word. I just don't use it anymore. I, I don't care if you do it. I don't let other people not do it. I just don't do it. But I will not stand around when people start denigrating women's sports as if it's somehow a bad thing. They can, they can do it, it's not around me. And, and I, I don't watch the NBA because I don't watch anything really but the NBA. And now a little bit of college only because of my son. 
Uh, but I do like watching women's sports. When I put it on, the drama is the drama. What does it matter? That's we have men have a big issue with that, right? Uh, a big issue. You watch plenty of college games. There's no dunks, so why not watch a women's college game? Well, there's not there's not as many dunks. So there's certain dunk. <laughs> there's women that are starting dunk now. Women's soccer is unbelievable. Women's softball might be the best sport there is. I don't say women's softball because I don't think there is a men's softball league in college, but college women's softball is fucking unbelievable. And I'm a cool dude, right? And so I say it because you want to be cool, you can embrace women's sports just fine. It doesn't make you less cool to think women's sports are amazing, right? And they're and Doris Burke is the best. I, people love Hubie Brown. I have my own thoughts on Hubie Brown. Doris Burke's the best there is right now. And if she was the new person covering the finals games, no one would be happier than me. Not Jeff Van Gundy. Tom Mark Jackson, Doris Burke, the defense race. I remember I had Renee Montgomery on the Haber Show pod a couple months ago, and we were talking about Kelly Leffler and the Atlanta Dream and how Renee Montgomery had like stood up and said, this isn't right. Uh, Kelly Leffler needs to, needs to go. And she was playing for Kelly Leffler's team, which is yeah. so like, yeah. wow, like imagine doing that. And uh, Amin Alhassan and I were, were asking her questions about it. And I had this question – uh, I regret is I said, you know, if Kelly Leffler, you, you, you would ask Kelly Leffler to comment um, and ask for have, to have a conversation. Now, if Kelly Leffler did have a, um, a response to all your questioning, how would you respond to that? Like, what are you, what are there some of the things that you would respond to or wanted to tell her? She goes, it's not my problem. She needs to speak. The burden shouldn't be on the black woman to like cover up for her mistakes. Like, we're putting a microphone in front of Kelly Leffler and she is silent. It is not my fault she is silent. She does not want to talk. Uh, and she's like, it is not my problem. It is her problem that she isn't speaking. And the, the, the media should be asking, why is she not talking? And she's hiding behind the scenes. And I, and I felt bad because I was, I was saying, essentially, I was holding Renee Montgomery accountable. Like, what are your talking points? Right. When really... Like we're not taking Kelly Leffler to task nearly as much, or we're expecting her to speak for Kelly, which is so backwards. But the point is, um, Renee Montgomery is a is a fucking star, Rock and star. Um, I think what she did as a player um, for UConn, UConn, um, and in the WNBA, great, awesome. But her post playing career is going to be like ten times that. Um, I think she is just an amazing person, and also put me in my place when I asked her a question about, "Hey, what do you think Kelly should do?" And it's just like, no, that's not a question for me to answer. That's for Kelly to answer. Why am I speaking on her behalf? She's the one who's being silent. And so now you're seeing um, Kelly Luffler's out of the WNBA, and so we'll see what happens next. Well, uh, I, I want to just pick up on Gerard's point real quick. There's a lot more Renee Montgomery's if our system was better. Oh. That's, that's the story. Is there yes. so much more? Don't talent. worry there. Yeah. <laughs> There's such a drainage of brain power and talent power in just this country alone because of the system. That's the, that's the Candace entire. Parker, too. Candace Parker, amazing. Yeah. Is she, is Renee Montgomery, I went to look it up before the show. Is she one of the dream players who had to go to an uncomfortable dinner at Kelly Loeffler's house? Do you know, Tom? That's I, a I'm great question. Not supposed to put you on, not supposed to quiz you on this show. But, um, I read, some, I read some accounts of like players having to go there. And I remember just thinking like, God damn it, NBA, protect people from this, right? Like, don't make you go, don't make someone go to the creepiest dinner of their life with their boss who's going to like lord Trumpisms over them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, like make people feel safe. It's like job one. Um, anyway, Gerard, you look like you have an expressive, uh, you want to say something here, I can tell. Yeah. All I was going to say is to, agree with Tom like it is not the job of the oppressed and the disenfranchised to tell you why in fact they are oppressed and disenfranchised right yeah <laughs> it's, it says ask the oppressor and the disenfranchised well, well what is your reasoning for doing these things right like talk to those people so Judy couldn't make it today um she said tell everybody that I'm racing Formula One cars on the Almathy coast <laughs> and, what is, what and is she please, end the show she's she's racing formula one cars on the el Mafi coast <laughs> okay um Got it. and she and then she wanted to add please end the show on time was her only other wish so. no surprise there <laughs> so we're just about there we're in the final seconds um so i will begin the goodbyes uh thank you Gerard. thank you tom thank you david we'll be back on wednesday
Wait, but coach, what are your, what are your thoughts on chemistry in a locker room? I'm going to hit the end button. I'm just going to hit it. I don't care. Be safe, everyone. Uh, 